What's going on, everybody? It's B Mills for days. Tonight, we have five horror stories. Let me tell you, some of these stories get crazy. Well, I hope y'all are ready. I'm posting this here because the dream I had last night sounds like something out of a horror movie. It was like a nightmare of the devil. Last night, I had a nightmare. I don't remember all of it, but I can remember some things clearly that I don't want to. It's kind of scaring me. I dreamt I was in a house with a family I've never seen before. I was the oldest brother. Something happened, and I can't remember all the details, but I can remember that the floor was broken, and I could see down into the basement there was a massive cage down there, and it was what looked like some guy. He didn't have half of his body. He was just a torso. I think he was the devil because in my dream, he used some sort of magic to pull my dream brother down into the basement and right on top of the cage. Once my brother hit the top of the cage, the man transformed into some sort of half man, half woman thing and half I don't even want to know. He ate my dream brother whole. The last thing that I remember was him screaming, no, please, then seeing that flat sack inflate. And I watched as he was disintegrated by that creature's gastric juices. But he didn't die. Every time he disintegrated, he would be remade wholly inside and would then disintegrate again in a non-stop cycle of being consumed. What the heck did I do to deserve a dream like this? We should have never entered the catacombs beneath Paris. The air was thick with the scent of decay and the narrow stone corridors echoed with the drip drip, drip of ancient water. But the curiosity has a way of leading fools to their doom, doesn't it? I still remember the moment the dust stirred as we uncovered the spores, mold that had waited forever for fresh lungs. It was Bastion first who coughed, a dry hacking sound that bounced eerily off the walls. Then one by one, we all followed, gasping, choking, unable to stop the invisible tendrils from winding their way into our systems. At first, it was the memories. They slipped into my mind so gently that I mistook them for my own. I remembered places I've never been, saw through eyes that weren't mine. I was inside my friends' minds, experiencing their joys, their fears, the intimate moments of their lives. The shock was gut-wrenching. Then came the pain. It wasn't mine, no. It was Elodie's. Her migraine, a crushing vice around the skull, shared generously among us. It was then we realized what had happened. The spores had bound us together, not just in memory, but in body and soul. The escape from those cursed tunnels was a nightmare. Every scrape and fall was felt by all. When Matthew twisted his ankle, the shared agony almost brought us to our knees, but the worst was the fear, multiplied by four, a looping feedback that grew with each shadow and echo in that godforsaken labyrinth. Getting out into the open air didn't help as we'd hoped. The connection didn't fade as we prayed it would. Instead, it solidified, deepened. We became unable to function alone. We moved together, ate together, slept together. Individuality was slipping away, a sandcastle at high tide. Then the thoughts weren't just shared, they were merged. All of our voices in a single choir, growing louder, drowning out who we used to be. I could feel myself fading, becoming just another voice in the chorus, fighting to remember my own name. The breaking point came when we couldn't stand the sounds of our own thoughts anymore. 
It was Mark who suggested it at first, a dark whisper in the back of our minds. If one of us ended it, would the connection break? Would the rest regain their solitude? We pondered, hesitated, then silently agreed. But who would make the sacrifice? Who could? We drew straws, barbaric lottery for such a modern curse. It was Matthew who drew the short one. The decision made, the act was swift. A tragic finale on a moonless night by the river's edge. But the release didn't come. Instead, his final scream, his ultimate fear, echoed endlessly in our minds, a loop that wouldn't cease. It was then we understood. The hive didn't diminish, grew hungry. Now we avoid each other, desperate to not add more to the collective, but the solitude is a lie. For even as I write this, I can feel them, hear them inside my head. They're waiting, always waiting, for the echoes to consume us all. My mind was plagued with the thoughts of my wife's infidelities as I barreled down the dark country road in my truck. I loved her, but hated the way she treated me, and the fact that she slept with my best friend made it all the worst. I was too caught up in my thoughts to notice the man walking down the middle of the road. I slammed on my brakes and closed my eyes before the truck came to a stop. I jumped from my truck and to my relief, there was no sign anyone was hit. As I searched around, I was suddenly startled by the sound of footsteps behind me. I hear you're having trouble with your wife. Sorry, do I know you? I asked as I tried to make out who the dark figure was. What do you truly desire? My head started to spin as I was overcome by a feeling of euphoria. I want whoever sleeps with my wife to die a slow and painful death. As the words left my mouth, it felt like someone else was saying them, and before I knew it, I was back behind the wheel of my truck. I had written off my strange encounter as a fever dream. As the days passed, I got word that my treacherous best friend had gotten sick and was close to death. Over the coming weeks, my neighbor was hospitalized with the same mystery illness my friend had along with three other people from the street I lived on, including the man who delivered our post. Days went by and news of men getting sick and dying all over town continued to trickle in. Suddenly I was hit with the realization that the man I met a few weeks ago wasn't a figment of my imagination. I got in my truck and began driving the same road as before. I was riddled with guilt knowing it was my fault people were dying. I slowed my truck as the same dark figure appeared in the middle of the road. Feeling desperate, I fell to my knees in a flood of tears. Please, I beg you, whatever you have done, you need to take it back. What is it you truly desire? All I want is my wife to love me and only me, I begged. As I walked in my front door, Suzanne was standing there waiting for me. I love you so much, Jack. Can you please forgive me? Of course I can forgive you. I always do. From now on, you're the only man I want and need. After we spent the night making passionate love, I woke up the following morning feeling like death. Suddenly, the terrifying realization of the first wish hit me like a ton of bricks. I write this as I'm in the final throes of death, as a warning to others. Be careful what you wish for. I never considered myself superstitious, but my perspective changed last week. I recently moved into a small old apartment in a quiet part of town. The building had a certain charm, 
with its creaky floors and antique fixtures. And the rent was too good to pass up. Everything was fine until I found the diary. It was tucked away in a hidden compartment beneath a loose floorboard in the bedroom. The leather cover was worn and all the pages were yellowed with age. Curious, I started to read. The diary belonged to a woman named Elisa who had lived in the apartment in the 1920s. Her entries started out mundane. Notes about her daily life, her love for gardening, and her fondness of the apartment. But as I read further, the entries grew darker. Elisa wrote about strange occurrences, objects moving on their own, whispers in the night, and a reoccurring nightmare about a shadowy figure standing at the foot of the bed. One entry in particular stood out. Elisa described how she had discovered a small door behind the wallpaper in the living room. She claimed that when she opened it, she found a narrow, pitch-black corridor that seemed to go on forever. She wrote about her hearing whispers, urging her to come inside. But she always closed the door before she would follow. I was both intrigued and unnerved. I decided to see if the door was still there. It took me a while, but I eventually found a faint outline behind the wallpaper, just as Elisa has described. My heart raced as I peeled back the wallpaper, revealing a small wooden door. With a deep breath, I opened it. The corridor beyond was exactly as Elisa had written, narrow and impossibly dark. I grabbed a flashlight and stepped inside beam barely cutting through the thick darkness. The whispers began almost immediately, faint and distant at first, but growing louder with each step I took. The corridor twisted and turned, seemingly without an end. I lost track of time and distance. The air grew colder and the whispers more urgent. I was about to turn back when I saw a faint light up ahead. I quickened my pace, desperate to find the source. The corridor opened into a small, dimly lit room. In the center was a single flickering candle, and beside it, a mirror. The whispers stopped abruptly, replaced by a heavy silence. I approached the mirror and saw my reflection, or at least, I thought it was my reflection. The figure in the mirror looked like me, but there was something wrong. Its eyes were hollow, and its mouth twisted into a sinister smile. Before I could react, the figure stepped out of the mirror and into the room. I turned and ran, the cold air biting at my skin and the sound of footsteps echoing behind me. I didn't stop until I was back in my apartment, slamming the door shut and collapsing on the floor. I haven't opened the door since. The diary disappeared and the whispers have stopped, but I can't shake the feeling that something followed me back. If you ever find a hidden door in an old apartment, leave it alone. Some things are better left undiscovered. I never believed in urban legends, but this one, this one got me. It started when I found an old VHS tape at a flea market. The label was blank, but curiosity got the best of me. That night, I dusted off my old VCR and popped the tape in. The screen flickered, and for a moment, I thought it was blank. Then, grainy footage of a room appeared. The camera was shaky, as if someone was filming with an unsteady hand. The room was empty except for a single chair in the center. As I watched, a figure slowly entered the frame. It was a man, his face obscured by shadow, wearing outdated clothes that looked like they were from the 80s. He sat in the chair, staring directly into the camera. For what felt like hours, he just sat there, unblinking. Just as I was about to turn it off, the man spoke. The voice was distorted, like a bad recording. If you're watching this, it's already too late. He 
See? This tape is cursed. It shows you the last thing you'll see before you die. I laughed nervously, but a chill ran down my spine. Screen went black, then the footage cut to a different room. My room. I stared in disbelief as the camera panned around, showing every detail. The unmade bed, the posters on the wall, even the pile of laundry in the corner. Then, the camera turned to show the door. Slowly, it creaked open. My heart raced as I watched a figure step into the room. It was the same man from the first clip, but this time, his face was clear. Pale, gaunt, with hollow, black eyes. I heard a noise behind me and whipped around. There was nothing there. I turned back to the screen and the man was closer now, almost at the foot of my bed. My breath caught in my throat as he reached out, pointing directly at me through the screen. Suddenly the screen went black. I sat there trembling, trying to rationalize what I'd just seen. Maybe it was a prank, I thought. Maybe someone was messing with me. But then I heard the floorboards creak, the same creak I'd just heard on the tape. I slowly turned around, my heart pounding in my ears. The door to my room was slowly opening. The last thing I saw was a pair of hollow, black eyes staring at me. If you ever find an unmarked VHS tape, do yourself a favor. Leave it alone. <laughs>